Welcome to the Young Crones Cafe, where you can get a magic brew full of all sorts of information, both witchy and practical. Grab a cup of coffee and join us. I'm Elizabeth, a wordsmith. And I'm Dave, a modern-day sage. We are going to talk about various witchcraft and life topics from a slightly more mature perspective, at least most of the time. Thanks for joining us. Today's metaphysical kernel of thought is divination. The practice of divination has been part of human history for thousands of years, and there are many tools commonly used today, such as tarot decks, runes, or pendulums, which can allow us to access our internal knowledge more effectively. Divination is often used to answer a question or questions, get an idea of energies that may be influencing self or a situation, or to get a glimpse of potential futures that may occur if changes aren't made in the present. We believe that all humans have intuitive perceptive abilities when we choose to access them. Children are often discouraged from listening to that internal voice, which on the path we refer to as our internal spark of the divine that often can give knowledge that is needed. Picking the right tool is a matter of personal preference and what makes it easiest for you to get the answers you are seeking. We are not wedded to the practice of divination. We don't feel it is necessary to consult some method for every decision we make, nor do we ignore it for important choices or to get confirmation that we are on the right path for us. We also tend to divine as part of a ritual, because we know that information gained through this method is often important if you ask the right question for yourself. We believe that divination matters as part of our practice, but the choice of whether or not to learn to use a particular method and use it as part of your own is always up to the individual. Divination. I had an entire, the the stores that I was working at had an entire section on that, and I had an entire section of that divination books. So this ought to be a fascinating conversation for us. Well, I think so. I think humans have always divined, or if nothing else, when you think of divination in terms of the most common form, they want to know what's going to happen before it happens. Right. So they can prepare or, you know, get a heads up or... Well, it's a matter of, at its, at its root, if you break it down, it's a matter of Seeking information for better decision making. There you go. I like that one. I attest that we have been doing that for over 300,000 years. I believe that when we first were able to look at the sky and understand it's probably going to rain tomorrow, tonight's a good night to plant. I I would argue that that was the earliest instinctive form of divination because we're taking a piece of information. We're looking at the sky, um, red sky in the morning or however you want to interpret it. Mm-hmm. Um, all over the world, there had to be people among a tribe that could look at a condition and make that connection to a decision. And I think that's primitive um, divination, and I think we still do that in our sleep a lot. Um, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think that's a good jumping off point as the start of divination itself, because the information they got was valuable and necessary to them. Well, that's just it. I mean, nowadays they, they say the difference between data information and is data is a fact, and information is the value that I can get from having that fact. Well, that makes sense. I like that. So, and yeah, I, I, again, we are seeking some some means, whether it's a, a Ouija board or looking at the sky or Native Americans. And some of the Pacific Islanders were famous for being able to look at the little tiny ripplets on the water and literally be able to tell you, hey, there will be storms tomorrow. Um, it, instinctively, we have always looked for those signs in our environment. But I think we have, uh, especially growing up in a modern Western culture, we've sort of divine or taken the word divination down to the act of doing it using a particular set of tools or a particular set of methods as opposed to just doing it naturally. Well, yeah, and I think that that's a good way 
to talk about that whole idea of children are often discouraged from listening to that instinctive internal stuff that we're born with. <laughs> you know, I think I think that stuff gets past. You talked about you know hundreds of thousands of years. I think that innate ability. How's that? Gets past absolutely, it. absolutely, and we absolutely. all have it, and it it's like any, and it's a skill. Sure. And like any skill, it has to be trained and developed, and the modern world doesn't value it. I mean, you were talking about in terms of the weather. Okay, now we can turn on the TV or look at an app sure. and get an idea of what the weather is going to be. You know, so we could argue that meteorologists are very unsuccessful practitioners of divination, but that's, that's a whole other story. But you, but you see where I'm going with that one. Sure, and and you know the in the reading the the, the uh, discussion about children are often discouraged. I have a funny anecdote that I've I've told for years about this, but I know what I saw. I mean, as a I I believe I was seven or eight years old, and I was busting around in the barn at my grandfather's house mm-hmm. where I wasn't supposed to be. Mm-hmm. But I know what I saw, and to this day, I could paint you a picture or draw you what it was that I saw, but at that moment, I was told by my uncle and my grandfather, no, there's no such things as ghosts. You just saw a reflection or a shadow. You got a little bit spooked or nothing. That wasn't a real thing. You imagined that. Mm -hmm. No, no, I didn't imagine that. I know what I saw, and what I saw was a form of divination. I mean, imagining is what it is. Oh, I think so. So then I was spent, the next 30 years of my life was spent not realizing that all of these little things that I was listening to and knowing and understanding, they were all being closed down. Don't exercise that. Don't use that anymore. Make sure they all atrophy. And so now I am trying different kinds of methods and different trying trying different kinds of things to see what it is that I had unlearned. Yeah, and you can restore. Sure, sure, absolutely. Because our brain is elastic in that sense. Neural plasticity, where we create new neural pathways. Well, and the the fun thing for me about divination as a as a hobby or as a a means of living or whatever whatever kind of an element it is in your life, to me the fun of it is exploring all these different types of divination. And I've I've come across some that, yeah, I get absolutely nothing out of that. It just doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. But I move on and try another one, and it's like, like me with the Witchstone cards. It just happens to fall out of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but you could look at a regular deck of tarot cards and get nothing. Well, I I have tried and struggled with tarot. I believe in my heart of hearts long enough for me to accept the fact that tarot for me is like pendulums for me. It, it, it just doesn't work there for me. Um, I love, uh, I love reading Oracle cards. I love different forms of divination and I, always been fascinated with natural forms like we've talked about but tarot for me just doesn't seem to be natural it's always i'm always trying Mm -hmm. to do tarot as opposed to some of the other things that i do that i naturally understand and can feel yeah this is this is the right thing for me to be doing and i think that we stress that as part of the reading is if you want to use divination great but you it's 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 almost like reading a book. If your natural language, if your first language is English, you're going to do fine reading a book that's written in English. But if they hand you one in Chinese, you're going to really struggle sure. and not get the message. You know, and and for me, I have to laugh because you mentioned pendulum. Sue used to be great with a pendulum. She really was. And I would I know. Uh, huh? I know. Yeah. I she know. Was. And I would pick up a pendulum and it would either sit there or just go in random circles. Yeah, mine wander around lazily. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So that it wasn't you, the right thing. And did you know I, the pendulums? Did you know the pendulums were originally um, a form of dowsing or geomancy? 
That makes sense. One of the earliest things that they used pendulums for was very similar to dowsing. Um, different cultures used it for finding places to dig well. Which is a skill. Absolutely. <laughs> and that <laughs> is a form of it is a form of divination. And it is a survival divination. Sure. I, I, I like when you and maybe that's a good way to describe the knowing that storms were coming or when to plant. It, that instinctual divination was also survival and necessary. Sure, you know, absolutely. I mean, a bear knows when uh, a bear knows when to go to sleep. Hopefully, even with right. With well, the one the ones that allow to be making more bears. There, that's probably true. <laughs> I, 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 well, I was just going to ask you out of curiosity, um, what different forms or types of divination do you practice or or if you want to just kind of give a quick rundown of the ones that you have tried or do you do you look at them as different methods like that um some of the modern ones personally um never connected with runes at all but i think to me runes are very culturally specific i think so too you know um, you have to be practicing heathenry to get the particular message of those, or like Agam, which is Celtic, same right, idea. Right, right, right. Um, well, I, and I really, I don't know, I've always felt that there's a pretty strong parallel between runes and stones and bones. And I think it's one of those things, you know, the, the, the chicken bones and things like that. I, I think a lot of it has to do with in different localities or regions around the world if you've put all of this math massive faith and energy and trust and intention and everything else into the bones then the bones will have power and in another region if you've done that in the stones or in the tea leaves because you know in the oriental or in the eastern world tea was a very sacred thing mm -hmm. um the native americans actually had a half a dozen different names for the different stages of a sage leaf. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. And and that's an example, again, of using what you have. Right. You know, or what, what, and I think there are those cultural memories that we have. Speaking of divination with tea leaves or Tassio Mancini, my very Christian grandmother, little old white fluffy haired lady, could read tea leaves. Yep. You know, would not would never have associated it with witchcraft or magic or anything like that. It was just something fun. Sure, a big tea drinker too. Um, for me, I do real well with tarot cards. Actually, I think because I never got into learning those stupid little white books, WBs that come with a deck. And years ago, I had the opportunity to take a course in. They called it intuitive tarot. Yep. Where you go in and you learn kind of some of the associations with numbers and colors and different symbols, bees, and different animals and things that may show up on a more modern tarot deck. So I don't use Rider Waite, obviously, which is the most well known deck. But the one I have, I connect with because I don't have some meaning in my head that it's supposed to mean. Right. I look at the card and it tells me a story, literally. Yep. And that's how I connect with it. But one of the reasons that I when I created the witch stones is we wanted a divination method that was that we could relate to on our practices that we you know our path practices. And we were had somebody that we were working with them because we've had different people, you know, that move in and out with us over the years who wanted to connect with some sort of rooms. Yep. So we literally created the original witch stone cards were actually originally actual stones. And we went to a local lake chore and got little stones and painted our symbols on them and all of that. I so in that sense, they were actual stones. And I, I find myself connecting more and more with the witch stone cards nowadays, the more I use them. I have that bag of stones. It's, it's in a case with Susie. Yeah, I know. That exactly. original and, and originally there was quite a few more than thirty two at one point. I know we were in the mid fifties. Oh, I know. We we went back and forth over the years. Things were added and discarded as our practices changed. 
Well, and I did everything I could during the entire episode to try to force you to use 32 because it was all twos and no threes. It just made the layout easier. <laughs> and well, for us, it's actually sacred fours if you actually get into it or eights is the case, maybe. Right, right, right. And I am miserable at scrying because I don't visualize. You know what I'm saying? Yep, yep. <laughs> Not a method that works to me. I love people who can do it. I think it's cool to watch, you know. All right. And I think one of the big takeaways from divination before we go any further is you don't have to, as we say, be wedded to your method. I mean, I know people who can't get dressed in the morning and pick an outfit without consulting something. And yeah. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dive into that. In fact, that will probably be the rabbit hole of the week. But oh, uh, I was just gonna mention uh, out of curiosity uh, a couple other. Have you ever messed with I Ching? A little bit. Okay. It doesn't resonate with me, and that's just, I like the sayings in the I Ching book. Right. But to me, again, that's more culturally specific. Well, and, and it's interesting that you say it that way, because for me, yeah, I didn't resonate with the I Ching myself, but you, you mentioned the short little phrase. I actually have a copy of the Tao, the Tao Te Ching, that I keep um, usually on my desk. And there are times when I'll just flip to an open page or flip to a random page and read that quote and meditate on what that means in my life that day. Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't really thought about it ahead of time, but that's actually a form of divination. When I, when I open that book up, the page that I need to read will be shown to me. And that's, and that's the bibliomancy. That's yeah. the, faith, the faith and the belief that I put into the book in its pages. Oh, sure. Do you, you know. consider astrology a form of divination? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Okay. I think your natal chart gives you, you know, the, the, the stars at the time of your birth, that natal piece. Yep. I think it gives you some clues into areas where you might want to put some more work into your life. Okay. Or not. Or, you okay. know, this, this is where some of your natural talents show up. Predispositions, sure. Yeah, right. yep. Give you certain things based on the houses that they're in. I know there are people who think it is, and that's great, too. You know, I'm not going to read my horoscope in the newspaper every morning and follow, because that is so generic, it's ridiculous. You know, and, and there are people who think of it in those terms. In terms of divination, I think it it serves a different kind of purpose for personal knowledge. How's that? There you go. As opposed to potential futures. And that's another thing. Um, if you are doing a reading about the future, the important thing to remember is the cards or the whatever you're looking at, the rooms or the, the tea leaves will show you potential futures. It's not carved in stone. So that if you don't like what you're seeing, then it gives you a heads up about what you need to do differently now. So you know, that I, just, I, just, up. I just happened to be reading a short story the other day that spoke to the same theme. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one of your short stories. I would just say no more. How about a Ouija board? Those are meant more for spirit communication. A Ouija board is is the whatever toy company makes it called them. They were originally called spirit boards. Right. And they were a way for you to communicate with, for want of a better terminology, those beyond the veil a little bit. So because from a divination oh, point of view, you would be getting your answers not from the board, but from whatever soul or spirit the board had helped you make a connection with. Yes. Exactly. I just wanted to point that out that, yeah, you know, a spirit board can be a tool, but yeah. what you are practicing practicing is what is what is ghost mancy? I don't know. It wouldn't be necromancy, but yeah. you are actually connecting with a spirit of from something. which you are going to get information to base your decisions on. Just to, yeah. to, to take it back yeah. rationally. Yep. And I can take that sort of thing with a grain of salt anyway. Unless I know I am connecting with one of my personal ancestors, like genetic ancestors, because 
I'm sorry, my ancestors continue to exist because I contain their genetic material and because I remember them. So yep. they have vested interest in making sure they're not telling me to jump off the cliff. Oh, they want okay. To remember. Only so, consult those that have been definitely <laughs> verified to be on the good team. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Because, I mean, I don't think that we're surrounded by malevolent spirits or whatever, but there's enough different kinds of spiritual energies out there that aren't human in that respect. Sure. Like an elemental energy. So they don't consider necessarily human frailties or human concerns like we do. Right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> so in um, that, I, I don't mess with spirit boards just for that reason. Palmistry, reflexology, face reading, phrenology, reading the the features on a person's body. Have you ever had any experience with that? I've had my palm read a time or two, and sometimes it's been very accurate, and other times I'm looking at them like, you have no idea. You know, and and I think unless you have made a deliberate study of it, like I said, developed that skill, it's not something you pick up and just learn to do overnight kind of thing. Okay, I can see that. I think it depends on the accuracy of your information because you taking it back to those thousands of years ago, different things will give you different types of information. Sure. And you have to learn the different, for one of the better word, permutations, how they present themselves. Well, what that what that takes us back to is it's not necessarily your choice or finding or or just finding the right tool to use, but just like you know, if you hand uh, an amateur a sword, it's a matter of we have to do the time and the practice and the uh, the energy swimming in of to be able to have that sort of connection with the tool that we're using. Exactly. And I think that's like that with anything that you would use to divine with. Practice with it. Study yeah. about it. Learn about it. Understand it. Become sage in it know its limitations sure sure <laughs> absolutely you know um, it, and understanding the survival and societal based personal biases that we carry within us so that i know when i look at a reading i can spot where no that's just dave coming through in this reading um and being self-aware enough to understand um yeah, don't do divination when you're angry or upset and some of those kind of things. And I just, I have to mention that with any of these divina, uh, divination, there's a human in the in the loop here. So let's make sure that the human is properly motivated and, and in the right space to be trying to do divination. And the, that you are practice your communication skills to convey things in a way that somebody is going to get an important message if that's what you hear. Sure, sure, absolutely. And, you know, this isn't a big deal, but this is what I get. And being honest and saying, you know, sometimes you go because it's a balancing act because people who read cards for a living or whatever, people usually come with a major question involved because they have to pay for the reading. And if you don't get an answer for them, they're going to be upset a lot of the time when you think sure you know sure. yeah they 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 need the payoff for the i mean they paid for their ticket yeah they paid for their ticket now they want the ride sure so, you know exactly and i think that's another reason i rarely read for myself because you said i have difficulty separating me and what i want to see in a movie sure. actually there a lot of people do yep you know so i'm willing to pay for the ticket because I want that, no matter what word, uh, objective opinion. And that's that's so. I mean, you, you and I tend to yin and yang a lot, anyway. But that's that's so funny because I tend to be the opposite. I'm very very uncomfortable reading tarot for other people, mm -hmm. but I will use a tarot deck in different kinds of layouts to help myself make decisions. So right. I only feel comfortable using the tarot for my own context and. 
and keeping it that way is comfortable for me. Well, I mean, it's, it's what works for me. And that's the whole point of this entire thing is you have to figure out, do you want to use divination as part of your practice? How do you want to use it? And what tool or tools work for you? So that is the, the, the perfect segue back to this word that we both wrote in our notes, wedded. Yeah. You make the statement that we are not wedded to the practice of divination. We don't feel the necessary. Uh, yeah. I, I, I stipulate that I don't know that that's true. I think we are wedded to and forced to and compelled to do at least some divination. However, the caveat that is, I am considering dreaming as a form of divination because I believe not only is dreaming a way for my subconscious to help me process things that have happened in my past, but my dreams are also there to pro provide me some information about my temp my potential futures mm -hmm. so that I can make better decisions. So to me, dreaming qualifies as um, a form of divination. And I would say that I am wed into that form in that I don't know that I could be that whom I am without the fact that I dream. Okay. Yeah, I get that. And I think you're justified in that because you talked about working in a metaphysical store with a whole section on divination. How many books are there in dream interpretation and the symbology of what you're dreaming about? It had its own shelf, just like astrology did and tarot did. Yeah, absolutely. See what, I, see what I am saying? Yeah, and I think... Well, now that that begs the question, though, was all of, were all of the dreaming books put in the divination section because they belonged in there or because I believed they meant to be there? <laughs> or where else do you put them? Well, I'll have to go back and see if it's where the next person decided that they went with or whether or not they've been transferred. <laughs> but it's an interesting thought. And, and yeah, in yeah, and, and divination in its, in its most basic is an interpretive thing. Sure. You know, you see something or you do something or you hear something or however you get the message, and then you have to figure out what it means. Right. <laughs> and sometimes that's clearer than others. Right. Well, yeah, when you hear the wolves growling around you in a circle in the middle of the night, divination says you're probably going to have a rough night's sleep. <laughs> but the more esoteric and the more distant or the more emotional that those pieces of information need to be, the more intense effort it takes through forms of divination and whatnot to be able to get that information. Well, if the wolves are growling and you're inside your nice warm house, great. If you're outside on the mountain in the snowstorm, it's a whole different level of intensity. That was what I meant. Yep. Yeah. And, and things have changed over the years. I mean, I know personally I am never going to practice heromancy, which the Greeks and the Romans and a bunch of people were into, where they would sacrifice something and then read the entrails. Sure. You know, sure. that's yep. not going to be me. Yeah, you know, I, I saw the insides of a frog once. Uh, I believe it was Mrs. DeBrine's biology class. I still to this day remember the smell of that old 70s preservative. And yeah, I, I've seen the inside of enough frogs now. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, you, but you get the point. And I, I, I'm sure you and I each have a list sitting here of some of the funnier or things that caught our eye. Right. Of what you can interpret, like there is ornithomancy, which is where birds are important. Yep. Like, how many do you see? There's a song about you know ravens and crows. You see this many, this many is a birth, this many is a death. That's Wedding, funny. Birth, that kind of stuff. That's funny because I use the crows in my neighborhood. They tell me what's going on and what's moving around. And yeah, oh, yeah. there's there's different alert calls and stuff like that, that if you live in the same area long enough, you actually learn the dialect of your own area's crows. <laughs> oh, yeah, I believe it. I used to always, okay, I, there was a time in my life where I was on the road a lot because I would go visit someone who out of state elsewhere. And you get 
off the main highways to get to these little small towns. And then you've got, you know, spaces where it's 55 and then it's 30 for two blocks and then it's 55 again. And let's be honest, nobody goes 55. <laughs> and if I saw a crow, I knew there was a speed trap up ahead. And the crow would sit on the side of the road and get me to notice it every time. And I, 10 years that I never got a speeding ticket. <laughs> So, I mean, is that a form of Orinoff Samantha? I don't know, but it could be. It's funny because when I'm ri out riding my bike, I look at the crows to tell whether or not I'm going to make it home before it rains or not. <laughs> <laughs> but we use these for different things. You know, it's divination in a nutshell. Um, back to your definition and mine is speaking information for making better uh, about the future or potential future mm -hmm. so that I can make better decisions now. Yeah, exactly. And I am going to reiterate, the future is not carved in a block of stone somewhere waiting for you to run into it. No, the, the, the past is concrete and the past created this moment here. Uh huh. Any information I get about the future is still fluid and changeable and malleable and and up to me to apply my appropriate intention to. Yeah. That's, to that's magic. Magic. Magic, magic. Magic with a K. Magic with a K to manifest what you want. And you had mentioned Biblio. We mentioned Bibliomancy. That was and still is in in certain parts of life a very Christian form of divination. Because the Bible is the most popular book. To this so day, I, to so I did not day. tell you this before the episode because I, I wanted to see the look on your face. But yeah. I was named by bibliomancy through the Bible. Sure. I believe it. My original name was supposed to be Seth. Okay. Which is also biblical. Yep. <laughs> um Due to a, a story that I'll mention to you off air and whatnot involving my father and a few too many beers in a bowling alley. Gotcha. Um, later on, there was a discussion in our house and Seth was definitely ruled out. So my mother grabbed her family Bible and threw it in a it's fit of father. angst on the it's dining room table. It's not at your father. Okay, on the table. Gotcha. <laughs> and it opened to the 23rd Psalm, which is a Psalm of David. Yes, so is. I didn't realize it until this discussion, but yeah, I was named by biblical bibliomancy. Mm -hmm. I got to get a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> you really do have to. The people that ask me what the hell that's all about are going to be the most fun people to share the story with. Oh, please, yes. <laughs> you know, when you think about it. And, I, and Sue and I have tried seromancy, which can be fun. Melted wax. Oh, um, um, a dear friend of mine, Granny Goth, Ronsi, um, mm -hmm. did that at one of our uh, our rituals uh, with the, the group that I was working with. Yeah, it's very cool. You can drip the wax or pour it, let it drip into water. Well, she, she, she had us each. They were like little, um, I think they were chime candles. Mm -hmm. um, and we had them in a circle on a plate, and we yep. each lit one and put our attention, and then she looked at the form that was made where the waxes ran together. Uh-huh. I really can't, you know, kind of a saucer-shaped disc. I mean, yeah. really kind of neat, yeah. Yeah. And what was that called again? Seromancy, C-E-R-O. Cero. Okay, so Cero is candle or wax? Probably. I don't okay. know. You know, and how many of us have gotten caught up in a bonfire and seen things or a candle? Oh. I romance instantly. Yeah, in fact, I'm. Uh, that's almost like my my Achilles. Is you can light a flame, I will follow it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like squirrel. <laughs> right, right. You got it. That whole distraction thing. Oh yeah, like a, like a beagle with peanut butter. Oh please, yes. Yeah. You know, I am also a flame person in that respect. I love. Sure just sitting next to a fire and sometimes the, how, how high it burns or the noises it makes or I love the sounds of them. Yep. Or how long it takes something you put in it to burn. I mean, people will find anything that makes sense to them. And I think often the methods we use are the ones that allows us to, to hear that internal signal that's been yelling. I want your attention over here. Well, yeah. And we've been staring into fires for 
here again a couple hundred thousand years. So yeah, exactly. Well, listen, I'm starting to plug up, and you're looking like you're starting to get ready for nap time. So my <laughs> divination says that it's about time to wrap this up. You know. Yeah, I think so. I knew it was going to be a fun gab, though. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll leave you with this thought. People will use anything. They found, found bones of, like, tortoise, tortoise shells in China yep. that are over 3,000 years old, where they used to drill, like, a little point in the shell and set it on fire. And the way it cracked, they would interpret okay. it. So... Anything you find that that gives you that tug, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. And if it feels good, practice doing more of it. Yes. And if it stops working, it may be a signal that it's trying to find something else because you've grown and changed. And with that, be safe, be kind, and be loved. And may you find mirth and reverence in all things. While we've been having discussions around what we call our metaphysical kernels of thought, which are the whys that form the basics of our beliefs on the path, we recently realized that we could also share about our practices as well. These are the hows and whats that we, as practitioners on the path, actually do in our own lives. So we're calling this new segment Practices of the Path. This segment will be about everything from the various tools that we work with, as well as those we don't and why, to the solar and lunar cycles, herbs we use, crystals and stones that we work with, candles, incenses, oh my, and anything else we come up with that can give an understanding of what we personally do kind of enjoying with these. our magical yeah. practices. It takes us back to some serious basics of witchcraft. Well, and it's funny because I was uh, refreshing one of my altars here earlier this week, and the recent conversations that we've had about things like atomies and goblets and whatnot, or chalices, the the conversations were recalled, and I kind of see the pieces on my altar a little bit differently now after having that fresh discussion. So I'm having fun with it. They're, they they find all sorts of association, but today we are distinguishing, for one of a better word, between chalices and cauldrons. Gotcha. Okay. Which both can be used for holding all sorts of liquids and things. A, a cauldron is bigger, and B, it has a different association. When you think about it, years ago, your that witchy cauldron was the cooking pot that lived in the middle of everybody's fire. Sure, the big cast iron hanging on a hook above the fire, and that was what you got your soup in when Granny wasn't making spells. Yeah, or anything else. You know, it was the it was the when you think about it, it was the most important cooking utensil implement, utensil, whatever you would call sure. it. Victim. Well, and, and with you and I growing up, I mean, we have that stereotypical, terrible image of the great big huge cauldron with the the natives around it and the. <laughs> The Europeans in the cauldron. Well, of course they did. <laughs> you know, same same implement, just different associations. Right. Yeah. So what is, uh, what, I, I know you like to take a moment and actually bring out the definition. So do you have that for us for cauldron? Yeah, I do. Oh, shut up. They're doing that testing thing for the government today for the FEMA alert system. Well, and just trivial sideline here, but today is the anniversary of the first day, 41 years ago, my first day of boot camp. <laughs> well, there you go. We should fit right in. But back to definition. Oh, yeah, my turn with the alerts. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, very simple and to the point. A large kettle or cooking pot. Okay. No magical associations mentioned, et cetera, et cetera with some of the other things. But Sue and I always used to like to put sand in the bottom of a small one and put our incense charcoals in it. Yep. Very handy well, for that. That's, that's my primary sensor around here, primarily because we learned that the cat sometimes likes to wave its paw in the smoke. And <laughs> yep. I always thought a nice heavy cast iron with a lid on it is good cat proofing. 
Yes, it's also very good for when you're done and you don't want to pick it up because it's hot. You can put the top on it and just let the charcoal burn itself out. Yep. Yeah. Also makes a great uh, holder for either cone or stick incense. Mm -hmm. Or if you are doing spell work of any kind, it's a great place to pop all your ingredients into so you have them all in one place. Yep. Because or like I talked to I talked about a spell earlier today where you use a little piece of paper, you write some um, symbology on it and burn it. It's burning. a place that you could do that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, it is. Or um, we also, when you think about it, for magical purposes, we associate on the path the cauldron with the north because it's a very earthy type of association of food and all of that. When you think about its original purpose, and North we associate with black and night, and we think of that as a source of creation because out of the dark you get the light. So if you are working magic, that is a great place to put all your mix all your ingredients. Well, and it's I mean the the iron ore itself is directly from the earth, you know what mm -hmm. I mean. So it itself. Um, can be a representation for Mother Earth or, or the worm, womb of Earth as well, you know. Exactly, whatever you wish to call it. And there's all sorts of magical mythology associated with cauldrons wandering around. I there mean, is. the big ones, yeah, well, the big ones are the Celts. Okay. You know, that most, some, well, a lot of people have heard from, especially the Irish. The Irish gods were called the Tuatha Dé Danann, and I probably murdered the pronunciation again, but they supposedly came to Ireland with okay. four different gifts. There was like a spear and a stone of authority, for want of a better word. It was like the seat that the king sat on kind of thing. And there was a god called the Dagda who came with the cauldron of Muriath, which was associated with the idea of plenty. And he had this cauldron that he dragged around with him that never ran out of food or drink. Oh, neat. I had never heard that one before. And that, yeah. that, that, gives, um, that gives my mind more to think about with the cauldron. And that always adds more energy and more magic to it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Magic with a K. Magic with a K, exactly. Oh, and a, an eternal or an endless source of plenty. I Kind of like a cornucopia. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. And the sort of nourishment. But you had to be deserving. You couldn't be, you know, somebody who's out doing evil deeds or, you know, plotting to take over the world or whatever. You kind of had to be on the right side of things to receive this plenty. Okay. Which I'm okay. sure may have been a Christianized version of this. Who knows? But it's just the idea of the source of everything you need for sustenance well and i mean i'm i'm thinking about parallels in different cultures where you know it may be i love that you have one of our mugs <laughs> um different cultures where it may be you know the basket in which the rice is is stored or whatever that could be a you know a container like symbol of plenty or or abundance yeah like you said the cornucopia and then there was carrot win who was a goddess who supposedly gave birth to a son who was, I guess in today's provenance, he'd be the proverbial nerd with the glasses and the slide thing in his pocket and all of that. <laughs> and did not articulate, which was very valued among the Irish because they valued bards and everything. And she was brewing a potion in her cauldron of inspiration for her son to transform him into a social butterfly, let's put it that way. And she tasked this young man named Taliesin to stir this potion because you had to keep stirring it for days and days and days. And she was strictly told, don't drink it, don't mess with it. And he accidentally ingested three drops and got all this inspiration. And she chased him all over Ireland. And, you know, he would turn himself into a, a grain of wheat to hide and she would turn herself into a bird that could find him you just this endless story of chasing and, and, he had uh, a, a, and he all had beginning a, from a potion that was being cooked in the cauldron yep uh, exactly and he ended up having the reputation as one of the famous most famous bards 
in that particular Irish cycle of mythology. So just, gotcha. you know, little, little tidbits like that. So I, like I said, when I was talking about the source of creative inspiration and everything and out of the darkness, we get light. I am often drawn to the idea of that cauldron of inspiration of things brewing away until sure. they come to fruition. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yep. So that's kind of where we go with cauldrons. Well, and I happen to have a cauldron that has the the triple moon symbol. So now when I look at that, I can look at how it is connecting to whatever magic or energy I'm working for that particular moon cycle. Mm, that makes perfect sense to me. And you can find little mini cauldrons. We're not telling you to go out and buy the, you know, three foot soup pot that you need well, you know, a football team to lift either. <laughs> well, and the other thing that I was going to mention is like like I do with most of our other tools or whatever, I try to come up with some substitutions. I mm -hmm. mean, not everyone has a cast iron um, cauldron. Some people mm -hmm. might have a cast iron skillet and you could use that um, in a pinch for different sorts of cauldron type of work. I've actually used a glass bowl. The yes. secret is, like you were saying earlier, you put, you and Susie used sand in the bottom of your cauldrons. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to use a mixture, a half and half of sand and salt, because it gives me more of that grounding energy. Hey, but works. all you're doing is providing that as a buffer to keep anything mm -hmm. hot from shattering the glass or burning your fingers or whatever. So, I mean, you could use a cereal bowl and the salt out of your kitchen cabinet for yeah. a little mini cauldron if you needed to. Oh, sure. Or even even a, anything that's got, for want of a better word, a larger opening than right, right, right. Glass can be considered a cauldron. I mean, we use, it, it's, almost, it's almost a metaphor in that respect, that whole idea of the cauldron. You know, is the idea is it's a bigger container of right. some kind. Well, uh, the the chalice is one that is small, and I lift up to drink from. The cauldron is large, and I use to cook in. Yep. Or I take something out of it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I have the classic. Well, I have the classic dipper. Yeah, ladle. <laughs> ladle. ladle. Yep. Ladle is the word. Yes, the, the yeah. old ladle. Yes. You know, but yeah, but the, the whole idea is when you're talking about substitutions, and we need to keep stressing this when we're talking about this stuff, is you use what you got. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely. You know those from hundreds of years ago, use the cooking pot because it was handy. Sure. And it's what it's, they in had. In some cases, it might have been the old pot, only pot that they owned. Sure, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So that sometimes we need to, for want of a better word, think outside the box again. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I just envisioned myself. Look, I was just looking sort of mentally into my recycling bin, and uh -huh. I had a can of can of soup the other night, and I could clean that soup can out and put half an inch of salt in the bottom of it, or, or an inch of sand in the bottom of it, and boom, I have a cauldron. They also make great candle holders. <laughs> Okay, now you're just being witchy. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can even like punch little holes in the side of the can. Now you're getting artsy witchy. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, actually, I think that was Girl Scouts years ago rather than just witchy. That could have been. So, you know, I've always thought that, that, that the Scouts kind of had their own witchy, cultish accoutrements at times anyway. When you think about it, when you read some of the stuff, Sure, sure. I mean, I can remember, obviously, I was never a Girl Scout, no. uh, but I can remember Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, a lot of the the concepts that I was introduced to then later on actually became useful in some of my shaman practices because, I mean, basic wood, woodsmanship and, and that kind of thing is really an integral part of, of some of my practices. Sure. Respect for nature. You know, and, and that whole kind of, and being resourceful, using what you have. Right, is, right, exactly. Yep. Those things. And I think those are some of the most valuable lessons, because I was a scout, too, for years. Not a boy scout, obviously, but a scout, <laughs> nonetheless. You know, still have visions of my mother with a whole garage full of cookies every year, but that's 
We'll let that one go. I have a vision of me last year with about 12, maybe it was the year before, with about 12 boxes of the cookies that your girls were selling. <laughs> yeah, I think you got drafted into that one. Yes, Soraya was a Girl Scout, and yep. she, her mom took her cookie sheet to Walmart one day. Oh, we not, dear. We will not discuss how many cases of cookies we had to deliver to Walmart. You know. Well, she was popular, very much so. Well, that and the fact that Girl Scout cookies are damn good cookies, let's be honest. Well, you know, I mean. For the that, price, they're, they're good cookies. Nothing beats a Thin Mint. <laughs> okay, I like the lemon one. In fact, I think that's what going to be what I'm going to use for Housel next week is some Thin Mints. There we go. That works. Well, All right, listen, I know, you're, I know you're struggling yeah. waiting on some x-rays and stuff like that but i know you're on some medication so why don't yeah. you get some rest and uh we'll okay. record another segment tomorrow if you're feeling up to it yeah and i will see you soon we have heard from some of our listeners who appreciate what we are talking about in our segments but are asking for spells or about spells can you give me a spell for this or that i want to be able to Fill in the blank here. Find love, romance, money, etc. Since you asked, we are adding a small segment to some of our podcasts going forward that we are calling Practical Magic for the Everyday Witch. These are simple spells we use that don't require a lot of ingredients for correspondences or sometimes no ingredients at all. Because we like to be able to use magic to deal with the practical everyday stuff, this is what we have to share. However, the biggest reminder about spellcraft is that the best spells are the ones you create for yourself, because they are a part of your own magic. Actually, there are three important components to any spell. Number one is setting your intent. This means that you need to be able to state clearly and precisely what you want your spell to do and how you want it to be done. Number two is ingredients. Any physical items you need to cast your spell, such as candles or herbs, or to act as correspondences, which are representations of something physical that you don't have right in front of you or are trying to come up with or manifest. Finally, number three is some sort of way to raise energy. After all, all spells are powered by energy, and there are a number of different ways to raise this type of energy, including chanting or various movements. Feelings of crankiness are winning in your life. Everything the kids do makes you nuts. You have some major stuff to accomplish at your job. You are buried in homework for classes or you want to make time for your spiritual practices, and at the same time, nothing fits. You need to sweeten your disposition for a time before you say or do things you regret just because you are in a really bad mood today. This quick spell can be used to remind you that you can be in a sweeter mood or a sweeter person, and that you can use magic to change your mood for a short time. Your intent. I am sweet as a glass of sugar water for today. Only need a few ingredients. A glass of water, a spoon, and some sugar. Here's a spell chant to raise energy. I can be my mood adjuster as I stir and mix this water. Again, I can be my mood adjuster as I stir and mix this water. Here's the steps for this quick spell. Grab a cup of sugar, a glass of water, and a spoon. Sit down and take a few minutes for yourself, recognizing that your mood isn't what you want it to be, or it doesn't match what is going on around you. Stirring counterclockwise, start stirring sugar into your glass of water and know that the sugar is taking your bad mood from you. Repeat the spell chant over and over as you stir your water. Now. Pour this water down the drain and watch your crankiness leaving with it. Refill your glass with fresh water. Now take some more sugar and stir it into your water while stirring clockwise and know that the sugar is now sweetening your mood. Repeat the spell chant over and over as you stir the water, feeling your mood lighten. When you feel you can move forward without feeling so cranky, say out loud, 
mood change of sugar and water so easily as I will, so mote it be. Keep this water on the kitchen sink for the day as a reminder of your improved mood. Now dispose of it before you go to bed. And that's all there is to that. Before we go, we would like to present you with a tip or trick or witchy hint. Just something to make your day go better. Because we live in a mixture of the magical and the mundane. This week's tip, trick, or witchy hint. Wrap it in a bubble. Human beings are a chaotic and often predictable force in our lives. Even some of the nicest people are bound from time to time to upset us. It's inevitable. With that as a preface, I find myself recently in a situation a few days ago where I became angry. Normally, I'm able to roll with people's stuff fairly well, but in this particular instance, it had me and the other person pretty much shouting over each other on a phone call. Um, not my best moment, obviously. Um, things were said that were completely out of line. Blame was thrown around. Family was dragged into it. Just an entirely ugly affair. So afterward, I needed to find a way to just let it all go. I know we all hear that, let it all go, but how do we do that? It being the anger that I felt towards this other person, I had been deeply wronged, and a family member had been insulted. It being the shame that I felt from having stepped out of my normal character and become nasty with this person as well. It being the futility of the entire argument to begin with, I needed to find a way to let these things go. And that's not an always an easy thing for many of us. So today's tip, trick, or witchy hint is to wrap it up in a bubble. I picture an image in my mind of the person and the emotion, in this case, anger, and the shame, in this case, for being mean to someone that normally I care about. And, of course, the original issue that had us so at odds. I put all of these into a visualization of a big soap bubble. Now, for those like Elizabeth who struggle with visualization, a circle drawn on a piece of paper will suffice for the bubble just as well. Write your little pieces inside that circle just like I put them inside my mental bubble. It's meant to be a dissolvable container of sorts. So once I feel like I've addressed all of the ugly that I need to dissolve from this moment, I imagine the bubble floating away. Some imaginings could use the idea of a balloon being lost up into the sky and the clouds, or a soap bubble floating down a river or stream, or a cloud that's slowly fading away. For those who prefer the tangible paper, let it float away down a local river or stream, burn it and blow its ashes to the wind. Whatever mechanism that supports you being able to watch it fade. The point is that I can watch my distress float away until it's out of sight, around the bend, or simply faded from my thoughts. You can even pop the bubble if you want, but I prefer myself to consciously focus on watching it fade away. It was a moment that moment is gone, and I have learned from it. Oof. Let that stuff go. If you're enjoying this sort of content and want to join the discussion, come stir up the pot with us on our Discord community. Go to Patreon and look for Young Crones Cafe, or browse to twoyoungcrones.com for more information about us. For now, be safe, be kind, and be loved. Well, it looks like the coffee cups are empty for this week. We hope you join us again next Tuesday. But you can find us at our website, twoyoungcrones.com. That's the number two, Young Crones. We'd love to have you join our growing online Discord community. Check out our new Patreon presence. Just look for Young Crones Cafe. Through Patreon, you'll be able to make it to our Discord. 
We are also Young Crohn's Cafe on Twitter and Facebook. Until then, remember, we are witches who work with energies to affect change. We are believers in both imminent and transcendent divine. We are celebrants of the passage of the solar and lunar cycles. We are hedge walkers who pass back and forth between the worlds of the magical and the mundane. We are seekers of knowledge. And we are walkers of a spiritual tradition we call the path. So mote it be. So mote it be.